Hi, I'm Dennis Gage, and welcome to My Classic Car. Well, this week, we're in Philadelphia at the Simeon Foundation Automotive Museum. I gotta tell you, this is one of the most amazing collections I've ever seen, and it celebrates the spirit of competition, specifically road race competition. Le Mans, Sebring, Targa Floria, they're all here. These cars all competed, most of them won. And the most incredible thing is they all run. A couple times a month, they take them out back for demo days and rip them around. I gotta tell you, I've died and gone to heaven. This is gonna be a blast. Let's go racing. Fred, it's such a pleasure to finally meet you. Nice to meet you, Dennis. You know, I met your cars a while ago. I was at Radnor Hunt over a decade ago and you had the hippie Porsche there. And I've heard about your museum, your foundation uh, for years. But it wasn't until I got here that I fully appreciated what you've done here. This is amazing. What was the driving force? Uh, I think the driving force ultimately is the spirit of competition and how I could take a car collection, which was basically a vanity in the beginning, and turned it into something of cultural significance. You say the spirit of competition, that feels like the theme here. Is it, that, is. It, it is. It is. And was that the theme from the beginning or do you, it was a discovered theme? No, it's funny. You, you kind of you realize what you're doing when you're halfway through the collection. You realize what is the thread, what is the DNA behind this. And then it really were successful competition automobiles particularly in sports car racing which is something that most people can relate to mm -hmm. in contrast say to Indy or Formula One and where the cars are a little freaky and maybe something I couldn't drive but sports cars are or people's sp cars sports cars right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so the, the really the theme revealed itself exactly oh magnificent mm -hmm. wow well you've uh, you've amassed such incredible cars and these great displays but one of the ones that I was just drooling over was the Le Mans display. Let's 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 go walk that one. Great. I'll All love right, to let's do go. That. Now we're into Le Mans, right? This is the beginning of our Le Mans exhibit. This is a stunning car. This one is uh, one of the favorites and probably a hero of Le Mans because they only made a handful of these Alpha Le Mans cars. They're Le Mans because they had to have this rear seat. And in 1931, 32, 33, 34, and almost 35, those few cars, the Le Mans Alpha HC 2300s, won. It's interesting that it's blue. Yeah, well, what happened was when it became obvious that Bentley had stopped racing, they were dominant from 1927 to 1930, uh -huh. but they stopped racing when they were taken over by uh, Rolls-Royce. Um, the president of British Racing Drivers Drivers Club, Lord Howe, wanted to compete. Well, these cars were winning, they won in 31 and 32, so in 33 he bought this and painted it his baronial colors. Uh -huh. And that's why it's been known as the Blue, uh, blue Alpha. <laughs> I'm going, it's, it's an Alpha, it's blue. It's What's blue, up with that? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> this is a unique looking car. Looks like a study in Art Deco design. It, uh, a little bit over the top. Yeah, it is, bit, it is over the top. It was designed by uh, one of their better French designers, and there was a consignment of three of these cars for the 1938 Le Mans. This is one of the three, all aluminum body, no doors, special engine. Oh, by the way, this is the windscreen, and so this will crank up. It rolls up. It rolls up, wow. yeah. And, and these, are these functional, these? Yeah, they let air what? out and cool the engine off. Didn't <laughs> win the race, but it got a little award for being efficient. I really like the skirted uh, rear fenders on it. Again, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very elegant, uh, looking guy, this car looks fast sitting still. Right. You, you get the sense of motion. They made a passenger car with this shape, but these were aluminum body race cars. And pretty hot looking for its time. Real hot looking. Now we skipped into the 50s. This was one of my favorite 1950s design, 375 millimeter, and it's just a pretty car with a very aggressive uh, front end, particularly. Mm -hmm. And where did you find this car? This car belonged to William Holden. The windshield seems tall on this. Yeah, the windshield should only be about this high, but William Holden was a tall man. Oh, so, so that's his windshield? This is his windshield, yeah. This is not an original windshield. We could probably change it back. But it's cool that it was William Holden. it's Holden's. cool that it was William Holden, so we kind of <laughs> left it on. The highlight of the Maserati post-war era was the 300S, which had all the mechanical features of a Grand Prix car, the famous 250F, Maserati uh -huh. that we all know, but had a sports car design, very powerful, 
and the 300S was really the most successful. The smaller ones were successful in their classes, but not, overall, not overall successes. Uh -huh. And then they made, a, uh, they made about 10 450 cars, which were similar body, but big, powerful engine, and they most of, most of them seem to catch on fire or <laughs> not finish the race for one reason or That's another. That's never a good thing. So this it? is kind of right in the middle of, uh, of the successful era of uh, Maserati. But probably one of the wildest and arguably most beautiful cars uh, Ferrari did was this Testarossa. Yeah, not only was the design interesting, but also very successful. I mean, world champions and won Le Mans in 1958, 60, 61 with this chassis. Some of them had the pontoon fender, some of them were later designs. Also very successful in smaller races, successful in American racing, and kind of hot looking mm -hmm. with the sculpted wings to call the brakes. And by the way, a really fun car to drive. Is it really? Really fun car I to drive. Bet it is. Really responsive and, and let you know uh, it's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this was the first of your cars that I saw, like I said, at the mm -hmm. Radnor Hunt Concord over a decade ago. This is what they called the, the hippie Porsche, is that right? Right, right. By 1970, a Ferrari had reached its apogee, and now Porsche was taking over, and they still have maintained a strong interest in international racing. The 917 was, at this time, the pinnacle Porsche. I've been asked, why aren't there more Porsches? Well, it wasn't until the 917 that they decided to play with the big boys. Uh -huh. Prior to this, they were very successful at Targa Florio, very successful at the smaller races. But it wasn't until 1970 when the sister car to this won, and this car came in second. So this is a breathtaking display of all the European cars that, that, that competed and frankly dominated Le Mans for all those years. Uh, as you said earlier, Americans didn't really play and didn't really win until the GT40, but you got a special area over there for America at Le Mans. Let's go look at that, okay? Great. Okay, so here we have America at Le Mans, and uh, you got a, a couple Stutzes down there, and then a DuPont car. Right. DuPont was the only American car with an American driver that raced it to 24-hour Le Mans before World War II. But it wasn't until the GT40 when Ford decided they wanted to beat Ferrari that we got serious, right. and here we have it. This is the Mark II, right? Right, Mark II of the type that came in first, second, and third in the 66 Le Mans. Took it one, two, three. Yeah. Probably one of the most iconic race cars ever, but this is an interesting car here, which is also a GT40, right? Right. It's different. They totally restyled it, unlike that car, these were all made in America. They wanted to prove that America could make a, a winning race car. A lot of interesting technology here, but the same 427 engine, and one of these handily won the 1967 Le Mans. Hmm. This car raced there, had the speed record uh, at 224 miles an hour, but it didn't finish because at the end of the straight where they do 224 miles an hour, you have to make a sharp turn and it ended up in the sand. And he didn't. And he didn't. So it was Lloyd Ruby and Denny Hume and uh, they just couldn't dig themselves out. It didn't race again and it's the original paint. So, I mean, this is unrestored. This is unrestored. how she ran. And, this and, is and, how she ran. Wow. Well, you've also got your winner's circle, which is kind of, the, I guess, the best of the best. Let's have a look at, at, at those sure. magnificent cars. So Fred, this is basically the winner's circle. These are the cars that won Le Mans in these specific dates, right? Le Mans or Nuremberg. Right? Or Nuremberg, right, right of course, right. depending on, and, and speaking or of that, mm -hmm. that's what this is, right? right? This is a Nuremberg right. winner from 1927. 27. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a Mercedes. It's a Mercedes, Mercedes S-Series Mercedes sports vogue, and they made eight of these. They were the first S-Series cars, and this one went to the first Nuremberg Ring Grand Prix, German Grand Prix in 1927 and won. Wow. And, and this is very special because this is one of the crazier looking cars I've ever seen. This mm -hmm. is, it's a Bugatti, right? Right. Called the tank. The tank. That was its nickname. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can kind of see why, but I know that's your favorite, this Alpha. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite because first of all, it won a millimedia. It was far advanced for its time, independent suspension, double area valves, cams, two superchargers, transaxle, a bunch of new stuff. <laughs> two superchargers? Two superchargers. Wow. I think it's drop dead gorgeous. Oh, totally. They only made four of them. Um, it just has everything to me. I've taken it a few times to the Millimedia, and it's just a really a wonderful experience to relive. So, well, it must be a hit when that comes Yeah, they, they really love it over there. They know what it is, and they, they, they give it lots of respect. 
And you're right about it being drop dead gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, not an overall Le Mans winner, but a class winner. This is a Cunningham. This is one of Briggs Cunningham's cars, right? Right. He made two roadsters like this and a coupe. We wanted to have a, a winner from each of the five countries that race, so we had to honor his class win in 1954 with this car. And this was a Chrysler powered. Big Chrysler Hemi in there, tweaked to give a lot more extra horsepower. Great looking car, but I don't know how you I don't know how you beat the looks of this Aston Martin. Well, quite frankly, for a post-war sports car, I don't think you do beat it. <laughs> um, it's everything that makes a car beautiful. Underneath, it's a great riding car. They only made four of these, and this one won Nürburgring with Sterling Moss in 1958. As pretty as it is, it's that much fun to drive, um, and it's one of the stars of the collection. Uh, yeah. Definitely a fave of mine. Now, one of the great things about this collection, Fred, is that these cars still run. All of them, all of them run. Mm -hmm. Which well. is just amazing to me, because this is that, that's no small feat. So can we even do our own little demo day and take a couple out back today? Absolutely, so it should be great. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> Well, Fred, this is great. I just love bringing these outside because they do look totally different outside in this, I, I, in this light. I've always been amazed at that. Yeah, they come alive. And I wanted to go with, these are both 1936 cars, the Aston Martin and the Bugatti, and they really could not be more different. And they were both made for the 1936 Le Mans. Mm, which didn't happen. Right. Mm. <laughs> which maybe is why they're still here. But so let's start over here. This was a big car for 36, engine-wise, is that correct? It was even a big car for Aston Martin, who specialized in one and a half liter cars. This is one of only two two liter race cars they made that year. Wow, so the big show in this car is the engine. The rest yes. of it is pretty much Aston Martin. Can we look mm -hmm. at it? Sure, please. Sure. There we go. Wow, we got a couple big honking SU carbs, it looks like. Right. Single overhead cam? It's single overhead cam. It's got a, a magneto, which the other cars didn't have. The exhaust is changed from the one and a half liter engine. So it's just an enlarged one and a half liter engine, which was their, their landmark for pre-World War II racing. Well, and, and this thing fires up and runs like everything in here. Can we start this thing up and, sure. and, and uh, move it around? Oh, a little absolutely, bit? gladly. Let's, all right, let's do it. All right, fire it up, Fred. That's fun too. What do you say we take out the Bugatti? I love it. Well, Fred, the Aston Martin is magnificent, and it's kind of what you thought of a race car looking like back in '36. Right. This is not what I thought of a race car looking like in '36. This Bugatti. Nor did the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so surprised everybody, huh? Right. So why why is this design what it is? Well, the car originally started as a records car. In other words using a stock chassis, how fast could it go? Uh -huh. And that required streamlining, and this was the 1936 idea of streamlining. And then everything's, everything's open. I mean, the trans is right there, labeled Bugatti. And then again, this big bull nose with the louvers in it and everything. Can we look at the engine? Sure. Wow, wow. the Aston Martin was a single overhead cam. This is a, a, a double overhead, double cam. overhead cam. Mm -hmm. And like Bugatti's, it's that really square, you know, there's nothing rounded in this engine, very no, little rounded. No, it's, it's all chamfered, and then they put a little design on it. Almost always engine turn, right? Almost like engine turning. Beautiful. And it's got a special head because it had two uh, tachometers that had to be driven from the head. Well, let's close it up and, and, so, and uh, fire it up. Great, I'd love to. Wow, that's a bigger engine. 3.25, right? Yeah. Yes. How are you doing? My arm's 
So until our next meeting, remember, honor the timeless classics on Dennis Gage at the Simeon Foundation Automotive Museum. Happy motoring. Happy motoring.